So uh, just to let you know, in case you do not, Senator Savino is with us, Diane Savino represents the 23rd Senatorial District. That's Northern Staten Island, parts of Southern Brooklyn. She's the ranking member of the Senate Labor Committee, Vice Chair of the Finance Committee, possible New York City Public Advocate <laughs> I just can't help it. Um, an active member of her local labor union, the Social Service Employees Union, Local 371, PC 37 of ASME. She quickly rose to the ranks to become VP of Political Action and Legislative Affairs prior to her political career. Daniel DeSalvo is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, associate professor of political science at City College of New York, CUNY, author of Government Against Itself, Public Union Power and Its Consequences. His scholarship focuses on American political parties, elections, labor unions, state government, and public policy. Thank you both for being here. I appreciate it. Um, does either one of you want to go first or cede to the other? Well, I think I was going to allow Daniel to go first. That's very kind. Mr. DeSalvo, it's all you for 10 minutes. Um, thank you, Liz, for that kind introduction. I'd also like to thank EJ and uh, all the staff at the Empire Center for, for inviting me to participate in this discussion. And I'm also deeply grateful to Senator Sabina, Sabina to agree to discuss these important topics uh, with me today. Um, I'd just like to begin by saying sort of where, where I'm coming from. Um, uh, as my last name sort of gives away, I'm a third generation Italian American. I'm also a third generation to be represented by a union uh, here in the United States. My grandfather was an immigrant from Sicily, worked in steel mills in Pittsburgh, and was a part of the Steel Workers Union. My father was a carpenter and a member of the Carpenters Union uh, for many years. And uh, I have a PhD, and I'm a, a professor of political science at CUNY, and I'm represented by uh, the PSC CUNY. Uh, so, it, but that personal history and experience also highlights, I think, an, an important fact that the Janus case has really brought to light, which is the fundamental difference between unions in the public and the private sectors. Um, their activities, origins, and effects are really distinct. So I want to sort of begin with that difference that my own experience, uh, life experiences, sort of plays out. So you could say public employee unions and private sector unions they're of the same genus. They're both called unions. They both engage in collective bargaining. They both charge uh, agency shop fees. They some enjoy dues checkoffs. But really, they're, they're different species of labor organizations. And then, so there's really big differences. The first is legal. The whole issue of the Janus case is that it applies to state and local government employees, uh, not to private sector employees, not to federal employees who are governed by federal law. So the state laws are what govern, are in contest in this Supreme Court case. The second is historical. Private sector unions really in long existed since the 19th century in the United States, but really took off and gained great strength beginning in the 1930s, reaching a high point, you could say, with the merger of the AFL and the CIO in the 50s, and then suffering a sharp and steep decline since the 1970s to today. The trajectory of public sector unions completely different, basically non-existent for much of the 20th century, um, only really beginning to take off in the 60s and 70s, plateauing at about 35% on average of public employees in state and local government across the country since the late 70s, and that basically hasn't changed uh, a little bit of the margins uh, up to today. So totally distinct historical trajectories. Third, you could say there's big economic differences between the two. Uh, in the private sector, there's competitive market forces. You can think about uh, Boeing's negotiations with its machinist unions and its threats to move to right to work South Carolina. As was pointed out in the prior panel, you can't pick up your schoolhouse and move it from uh, Jamestown uh, to South Carolina. Uh, so there's just this absence of market forces in the public sector that makes it really different. It's more like bargaining in a monopoly industry in the private sector. A second and big and important difference is private sector unions are often seen by economists as having what are called threat effects, meaning you unionize one firm and that pushes up wages and then surrounding firms in order to compete for labor also tend to raise their wages, and this is seen as one of the beneficial effects of private sector unions. As far as I know, there's no scholarship that shows that public sector unions have any threat effects, meaning you can raise the wages of police officers, firefighters, teachers, 
and it does not change the surrounding wage demographic. They just don't have that factor. Economists have not been able to identify uh, such an effect. So those are just a few of the important uh, economic differences. And political differences. So that would be the last piece to the, of this difference, which is state and local uh, public employee unions have become political powerhouses. Uh, really, they're the force uh, in terms of, uh, you could say, boots on the ground and uh, finance and money in campaigns and elections, uh, much, as much or more than private sector unions today. Uh, and they can easily outpace them here in New York. The top lobbying spenders are public employee unions. The top campaign contributors are mostly public employee unions. So they really become these powerhouses in state and local government that even outshine their private sector counterparts. And really they exercise their greatest influence in really low turnout, off-cycle elections. Um, you know, Republicans may want to, uh, you know, repress the vote by uh, throwing up kind of barriers and having people show IDs and so on. Uh, public sector unions in a way suppress the vote by pushing for maintaining lots of off-cycle elections in this country, in part because they tend to be a larger percentage of the turnout in such uh, votes. And so I think those are just some important pieces of, of the difference. You could say overall, what have been the consequences of uh, allowing the Taylor Law here in New York, but allowing public employees to unionize and bargain collectively? Overall, I'd say that I think the research is fairly clear. They tend to distort the labor market, weaken public finances, and diminish the quality of public services. That's not to say that public employees don't win a lot of good things and a lot of benefits for their members. They do. But ultimately, the benefits public employee unions win for their members are outweighed by the costs they impose on the public. So what are some of those costs? Well, I begin with the increased cost of government. Public employees, when they're unionized, tend to earn more, which is clearly good for them. But it's costly for everyone else. So one study um, by professors at Stanford and Cal Berkeley found that municipal fire departments with collective bargaining spend about 9% more per employee on salary and 25% more on benefits. When you have uh, an agency shop, uh, another economist finds that government workers tend to drive up pay by about 10%. And of course, any pay raises are then factored into your overall pension tab and liability, so that's just pushing up the cost of government across the board. Government also tends to employ more people. The report that all of you, some of you have read, or all of you are going to read now on the Taylor Law, uh, O'Neill and McMahon find that you know, state and local government payrolls here in New York have grown, grown by 53% since the enactment of the Taylor Law, while private sector job growth has only been 23%. People talk about this often with teacher salaries, with this wave of recent teacher strikes. In some ways, we've had teacher salaries have increased over the last three decades, but they could have increased more if the ratio of teachers to students hadn't fallen so dramatically, meaning school districts are hiring more teachers, hiring more support staff. So in some ways, there's always a trade-off between hiring more workers and paying a smaller pool of workers more. Unions are engaged in that. In either direction, you, this, the government itself is still on the hook for more pay, more compensation, more workers. So I think the broader findings you could say on this cost of government is I think there's a fair amount of economic evidence to suggest states with strong public employee unions tend to have greater debt, higher interest rates on their bonds, and spend more. So and I think this cost issue goes to um, a last point, which is government is ultimately less efficient and less innovative. All the discussion earlier about past practices. There's a lot of things in collective bargaining contracts where we just keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and there's no opportunity to innovate. We have a lot of uh, complex and difficult work rules that tend to emasculate management and not allow it to innovate. One of my favorite examples uh, comes from California where the Corrections Officers Union had negotiated a contract that did not allow prison wardens, despite the fact that you're paying prison wardens $400,000 a year in salary, <coughs> uh, to manage the prisons, they could not assign corrections officers to specific duty. The officers themselves put in a, on a sign-up sheet for which duties they wanted to, to serve. Um, this just gives you an idea of the sort of redundancies and inefficiencies that can emerge. 
So this brings me, I think, to these negative consequences of uh, introducing collective bargaining into the public sector has now come to a head with the Janus case. In my view, this would be uh, a, a ruling in favor of Mr. Janus would be both a positive one in principle and in practice. It would pr protect the fundamental rights um, of dissenting public employees who do not want to be members of unions and contribute to them. And it would slightly, probably in the longer term, reduce union political power, which would provide state and local governments with the breathing room that they need to address looming fiscal challenges. Just say a couple of quick words in my 30 seconds of remaining. I think the two core arguments for why this is a First Amendment free speech violation for the percentage of public employees who don't want to be union members is one, the court's inability over a long series of cases going all the way back to a boot or sense of boot in the 1970s to separate collective bargaining and politics, where and how to draw the line. In the public sector, it turns out to be almost impossible. And the second argument is the inherently political nature of collective bargaining in the public sector insofar as wages, benefits, and work rules are basically ultimately political decisions about the cost and way public, and, uh, public services are going to be carried out. So in the long run, I think the effect of Janus, and we can go into this in more detail, will be lost agency re fee revenue for unions and some membership decline, which will probably have the beneficial effect of leveling the political playing field. Okay, thank you very much. Senator, you're up. Thank you, Liz. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for that for your presentation. I also want to thank the Empire Center uh, for inviting me to participate. I want to thank the previous panel, and I want to thank uh, all of the audience members for their uh, attendance here today. I want to thank the previous panel for being brave enough to sit in front of a room full of mostly police. Because um, <laughs> you may not have realized it, but um, thank God they were at arm today. Um, this is a, a historic discussion about an historic piece of legislation and a historic decision that we're awaiting in a historic time. Um, and I noticed in the report, the Empire Center for Barrett about the terror law, you gloss over, though, slightly on the first page, of the history of what led to uh, public sector collective bargaining in New York City, first in New York State in general. Um, and I think everyone who talked made reference to their own family's history. I always find it amusing when people talk about their family's history, that they, you know, they were, they were you know, a union member themselves, or their family was a union member, and then we get to the but. But as always, I believe in unions for those people, but not this group of people. The idea of workers banding together for mutual aid and protection did not occur in the 1930s. It didn't start in the last century. It didn't start in the United States. It can be traced all the way back to the Middle Ages. The medieval craft guilds were the beginning of the idea of workers banding together for mutual aid and protection. The idea of workers trying to figure out how they could control their workplace and figure out how to value the labor that they traded in the marketplace. It's the beginning of what is the modern day building trades. The apprentice, the journeyman, the master craftsman. The desire to have some control over your work life. Not just about money, but about your day to day work experience and about having dignity and process. And that is something that drove workers from the Middle Ages through the Renaissance, into the Industrial Revolution, here into the United States, into the great worker rebellions of the late 1800s, into the 1900s. It's what drove working people across this country in the rebellions across the, the, the dock workers, through the hay market. Uh, we saw this over and over. It's what drove elected officials to try and finally try and figure out how do we provide process and labor law and how do we try and control workers so that they felt that they had some control over their work life and manage the economy? And many elected officials tried to do it over the years, some with success, some with not. FDR, the icon of the labor movement, who I spoke about him on the floor of the Senate when we passed the budget and we adopted um, what we believe is a reaction to what is going to be a negative decision in the Supreme Court in the Janus case. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a New York State Senator for one term before he was Secretary of the Navy and then went on to become the President of the United States. Icon of the labor movement. But he did not believe that public employees should have collective bargaining rights. 
even as he signed the National Labor Relations Act. He also didn't believe that farm workers and domestic workers should either, but that's a different argument. He felt that public employees already had the protections that had ironically been granted to them in New York State by another Roosevelt, a guy named Teddy Roosevelt, who created the Civil Service Merit System in an effort to break the back of Tammany Hall when Teddy created the Civil Service Merit System, he believed that public service belonged to the public, not the political class. And if you establish the Civil Service Merit System, you created fairness and process. And that was good enough. And that was pretty much the law for many years. And your report re references, though, there was unrest among workers. They still wanted more. And so unions became, they existed in the public sector, but they didn't have collective bargaining. I came into the public sector in 1990. I took a job at the city of New York as a caseworker. Uh, I did not know it at the time, but I joined what was an historic union in the city of New York, the Social Service Employees Union Local 371. It was one of the unions that went on strike in 1965. They were welfare workers. Uh, they went out on strike, not just for money. They were a, a young union. Uh, they were mostly young social workers who had answered the call of John F. Kennedy to do more for your country. Many of them had been involved in the civil rights movement. They had been involved in the anti-war movement. Uh, they came to New York City to join the welfare department to help make life better for people. And they went out on strike not just because their caseloads were 50% higher than the national average, but because they worked in deplorable conditions. And by the way, the city of New York, when they used to negotiate leases with commercial tenants, negotiated with the worst slumlords in the city of New York. So they worked in horrible conditions, they had horrible caseloads, but they also wanted to improve conditions for their clients. They felt that their clients needed, yeah, I see the five minute mark. So they went on strike in 1965, in the middle of the winter, and their leaders, under the old Condon Wadlin Act, that's why I love the Taylor Law. Everyone hates the Taylor Law, they should know its predecessor. It was way worse than the Taylor Law was. Every one of them was arrested. They spent 19 days in jail. Every editorial board attacked them for going out on strike, including the venerable New York Times, called it an act of war against the government. Eventually, though, they won that strike. And they got a raise, they got collective bargaining, and they got the beginning of what came to be known as the Office of Collective Bargaining. And it still wasn't enough, though. It was still unrest. The transport workers uh, went on strike the next year. The teachers went on strike the next year, eventually leading to the establishment of the Taylor Law and all the things that have come since then. So where are we today? 50 years later, workers are still fighting and struggling, banding together for mutual aid and protection. We saw it yesterday on the steps of City Hall. Uber, drive, um, Uber drivers and cab drivers banding together because they see market forces working against them. We see public employees under attack across the country. It started in Wisconsin seven years ago. It's rippling across the country. Daniel made reference to the private sector being different than the public sector. It is in many ways. 50 years ago, the private sector represented 35% of the organized workforce. Today, it's 6%. Janice, the Janice case is not an accident. Mark Janice is a child care worker in, where is it, is it Wisconsin? Illinois. Illinois. Does anybody really believe that he was so offended by having to pay union dues that he managed to find a way to bring a case all the way to the United States Supreme Court, challenging that his requirement to pay union dues was um, a violation of his First Amendment rights? No. There are, more, there are forces against us. The enemies of labor never sleep. There have been people who have been systematically bringing cases like this state by state, whether it was funding right to work states and legislative efforts there to dismantle workers' rights, whether it is attacking public employee unions state by state, it is about silencing the representatives of workers, whether they be private sector or public sector. <clears throat> and we, as representatives in government, have a responsibility to go back and make sure that workers have the continuing right to band together for mutual aid and protection so that they can have a fair shot at the bargaining table and in the marketplace. That's what's at stake with Janice. It's not about whether or not somebody is forced to pay union dues. Because quite honestly, they're not forced to pay. I was a grievance rep before I was a vice president, and before that, I was a delegate in the workplace. We always had members who objected to being required to pay towards political dues. 
They were entitled to request a rebate. I would provide them the form. They could get back the portion of their dues that went to partisan political purposes. But the portion of their dues that went to the operation of the union, they were not entitled to have that. And that's what this is about. If you take everything, you bankrupt the union, you bankrupt the union's ability to influence public policy, not just to elect the politicians, but to elect public, to, uh, to influence public policy in general. Whether it's about caseloads, whether it's about how many men you have on a truck, whether it's about how to protect neighborhoods, unions have a role to play in that as well, because at the end of the day, public employees are members of the public. They are the tax base. So when we talk about the cost to the public, how much money it costs the taxpayer, well, they're taxpayers themselves. And when you pay public employees, they take that money. And you know where they spend it? They spend it right here in their own communities, in this state. The money goes right back into the same community that pays them. Are you done? I'm done. No. <laughs> you have a minute. So I'll just say, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm not currently represented by a union, but when I worked for the Times Union, I was, and it was a closed shop, and I did, as a political reporter, request that I get the money back that would be dedicated to political action because I did feel it was inappropriate for my money to go in that direction. It was a very small portion of money that I got back every year. It was not exactly e as easy as you painted it, but I didn't belong to your union. I belonged to CWA. So it required, it required me to write to um, National and it was a pain in the butt. However, they did send me a check at the end of the year. So um, I I'd like to start, uh, Senator, after your passionate uh, speech or opening rather, just with this question. You know, there seems to me, and even labor leaders as um, established as Randy Weingarten, who we're all familiar with, of course she used to be a teacher's union leader here in New York and now has gone on at the national level, mm -hmm. have admitted that the side effect of Janus has forced unions to actually do a better job. Yes. And they have been undertaken internal organizing and done some of the things that one might argue they should have done all along and we're not doing. And so therefore, one might say, what is the problem to actually hold unions to a higher standard of really honestly representing all of their workers? Uh, the solution really is to go out there and organize. And look, for many years, uh, I've, I've said that many, many unions have gotten somewhat lazy. Because it's hard to talk to work. It's hard to talk to your members. In many ways, it's like elected officials. It's hard to talk to voters. You know, there. it's much easier to uh, interact with people who agree with you all the time. So you have some union leaders who only like to talk to their hardcore supporters and they don't want to go into their workplaces. In the public sector, you have a captive audience with your members. Uh, and it's in much the same way that the employer has a captive audience. But you should go out there and talk to your members and explain to them it's not just about money. If you're going to make the argument about money, the boss is going to beat you every time because they have more money than you do, right? But go out there and explain what the value of being a union member is. Why it's important that they, re they retain their union membership. The ability to vote on the, bar on the, on the contract. The, abil the ability to vote for uh, union leadership. The ability to participate in developing the union's agenda. There's a whole host of reasons why you want to be a member. But I will be honest, there, have been, there were some unions that I believe uh, relied upon the agency shop law because it was easier than actually having that conversation. So to the extent that this was a wake-up call, and they've developed uh, policies where they've gone out and interacted directly with their members, it was a good thing. And do you honestly believe that there would be a significantly high outpouring of union members if in fact Janice goes in the direction that we believe that it probably will? Um, in New York, which I is think, a highly unionized state. Right? Well, I, I can only I can only use the Transport Workers Union as an example. So in 2000, was it 2005? 2006. I think it was early 2000, um, December of 2005, when they went on strike for Christmas. For Christmas, and then it was early 2006. They went on strike. They were all fined when they came back. They lost their automatic dues check off. Uh, in spite of the fact that they were a militant organization that all agreed to go out on strike, they went out on strike together. They came back. You know what? A lot of the members refused to voluntarily hand pay their dues because it's money in your pocket. And when you've been out on strike and you've lost pay and your family has suffered financially, whether it's $50 a paycheck or not, everyone says, well, it's just me. If I'm, you know, it's not going to hurt the union if I'm the only one that does it. Well, you multiply that by a few thousand people and you can cripple an organization. You have five minutes. Um, do you 
But I'll just respond to Please. Uh, this is I guess the first thing, um, most importantly to say is, um, I have no objection, and uh, there, there, there is no objection, I think, to uh, Senator Savino's position that uh, workers in the public and the private sector should be able to band together and exercise their rights of freedom of association, that they should be able to uh, form groups, call them unions, call them associations, that engage in all kinds of political activity to advance their interests. I, I have no objection to that whatsoever. I think the issue here in the Janus case is about coercing or forcing people who do not want to contribute to an organization um, to be in some way part of it, even if they can't officially become a member. The old union position, um, going back a, a century, which was ultimately decided by the Taft-Hartley Act and then subsequent um, Supreme Court cases up until, in fact, 1963, was that unions, both in the public and the private sector, wanted all people to be forced to be members. That was the original definition of the closed shop, whether people wanted to or not. And there's a, a, an underlying logic to the union position. You, you want to eliminate free riders. That's going to be able to create uh, labor peace, because you're going to have a stable bargaining thing that's going to be forced to represent everyone. Um, in that unit, but the Supreme Court and the Taft-Hartley Act said you can't force everyone, to, people to be members of something if they don't want to be as a condition of employment because that violates their First Amendment rights to freedom of association. So the whole issue in this Supreme Court case is the Supreme Court, and then in 1977, in the Abood decision, for, at least as so far as it goes for the public sector, said, well, you, you can't be forced to be a member, but you can be forced to pay. Mm -hmm. um, now, most unions set the, then whether you're a member or not, you're basically paying the same amount, whether it's you're an agency fee payer or you're a union member, it's then only if you take the further step and object to the political spending. But even there, and here's, this is I think the crux of the Supreme Court case, the issue is, well, who gets to decide what's collective bargaining expenditures and that are chargeable and what are, uh, political expenditures. Well, it's very hard to draw the line, and the union has, in effect, unilateral control over that. Sure, you can, again, from another Supreme Court case, this is why these free speech issues have been so persistent and there's so much, so many Supreme Court cases, you can request your Hudson rights. But anyone who's requested their Hudson rights looks at these budget categories. Many of them are extremely vague. Um, member education. Lots of things, especially in the public sector, that look like um, you know, that are considered chargeable look like to someone else like political expenditures. Yes, you can contest those, but it's this curious thing that it's all the burden is then on the worker to get their, to the dissenting or to get their freedom, free speech and free association rights protected. And it's this inability to separate collective bargaining from politics because they're both directed at the same entity, the government. And this is really different than the private sector where you're directing your political activity at the government over here, and you're directing your collective bargaining activity at your, the firm or the company over here. So you can see a clear separation in the public sector that this distinction is completely collapsed. So I think that's the core issue that's at stake and why this free speech problem is there in the public sector and this coercive element of agency fees. I mean, it's a bizarre thing. I mean, in what other walk of American life do you say, if I take a job, I have to contribute to a highly political organization <coughs> in one way or another? <coughs> Even if I can say I get my money back or I don't, uh, I've got to contribute $40 a month or $50 a month or $1,000 a year. Would somebody say, look, you know, we really feel like you should be contributing to the Sierra Club as part of your job. Many people say, well, I don't, maybe I like what the Sierra Club well, Maybe I have to contribute to the NRA. Well, arguably, we all pay taxes to the federal government, which is inherently a political entity. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, but to this that out there. To, to, but this is different because you're paying it to a private outside entity that you're saying is representing, paying taxes to the government. The government has coercive authority. But saying, as a condition of your job, you have to pay this outside third party entity. It's a curious situation. So before I, before I turn to you, Senator, I do have a question. Well, also, I mean, uh, in, in our shop, at any rate, there are, there are other ways, although there are loopholes and they're not 
they're not readily available to everyone. We had one in 10 option, which I exercised, which made me hideously unpopular, not surprisingly, among the stalwarts of our union. But there are other opportunities for you to not uh, to opt out if you want to, not merely, and I didn't pay anything as a result of that, because of one in 10. In the, in the public sector, you, like in my own case, I can tell you my own personal experience in CUNY, I'm an agency fee payer, you must and the CUNY is less restrictive, the PSC CUNY is less restrictive than many other cases. Most teachers unions, if you want to be an objector, you have to write the objector letter every single year yes, within a 30-day window. Sometimes it, unions make it as complicated as possible for you to get out of it. Then you get, so you write the letter. In the PSC CUNY case, you write it once, and then it's considered, you're considered an agency fee payer, and you want your rebate. But that's just, but you, many people don't necessarily know their rights. They come in, they say, I didn't sign the union card, I'm an agency fee payer. For years, they're paying this, basically 99% of dues. They're not getting any rebate back. And that's not a negligence. No one came and informed them. The only person that now under New York State law, they will have a 30 minute meeting with union officials to tell them all the reasons why, but they're not gonna be required to say, here's how you could get out of it too. There's gonna be no one in that meeting telling them that. Um, so, Senator, go ahead. With, with all due respect, Dan, I've never heard one single agency fee payer complain about the raises that were negotiated at the bargaining table that they automatically receive once they're collect, once they were negotiated. I never heard them complain about any of the benefits that get negotiated at the bargaining table uh, that they they get because of the fact that the agency fee payers. The other thing is the reason that you're required to be covered for an agency fee payer is because the employers also negotiate and grant bargaining rights to particular uh, bargaining units to represent these titles. So that's that's been this situation sometimes for decades. So when you come into the public sector, you know that you're going to belong to a union or you'll be an agency fee payer. Your title is represented. Somebody holds a bargaining certificate. Uh, and by the way, if it were up to me, I, we wouldn't cover free riders, but I'm a hardliner on this. Most people think that, you know, uh, unions are supposed to exist to improve conditions for everyone and that it's in the interest of the labor movement to raise uh, the floor <coughs> because when you raise the floor you raise the ceiling and that we want to capture everybody and that what we should be doing is using this uh, Janice case as an opportunity to go out and explain to people why it's better to join the union um, and they're probably more right than I am I'm more of a hard ass on this stuff uh, but again it's not as if agency fee payers even if they have a philosophical objection, aren't deriving a direct benefit from being represented at the bargaining table by these unions, whether it be um, in, in contract negotiations, whether it be in grievance arbitration, whether it be, uh, because there's a cost associated with all of those things, whether it even be in the halls of the legislature to improve terms and conditions in either the agencies that they work for, whether it be at budget time, you know, PSC uh, is in Albany on a regular basis fighting to improve conditions at CUNY to make sure that we elevate the standards there and elevate the funding. Uh, one of the biggest challenges for recruiting and retaining professors at, the, at, at CUNY is the inability to get tenured professors. We have far more adjunct professors now than we have full-time tenured professors. Let's say Janice passes and we lose the ability to uh, directly collect uh, dues from members. How effective will will you know Barbara Bowen and the PSC be with continuing that argument? Well, we, just to be clear, though, they've not been terribly effective. I know up to this point, and Janice has not yet been decided. Right, because they're and it'll be even worse. So all of these public well, institutions we don't know that actually, suffer. do we? We well, don't know. Well, I I can't imagine it would get any better. Explain to me how the situation. Who would, who would advocate for the expansion of full time tenured professors? Well, ostensibly, you would advocate for yourself but based on your merit. Okay, well, uh, how, how is that working out for any of them now? It's not because they don't have the right to do it. They're in collective units. They could, listen, they, nothing, nothing prevents him from advocating on his own behalf. If you don't have an organized effort, no one is going to be able to increase or improve their own standing. It's the reality. So, but to the senator's point, you know, in right to work states, and I had this conversation briefly with EJ, and I asked if there was scholarship on this, and you probably know, I'm not sure if we were able to determine it in a five minute conversation. But in right to work states, it seems to me actually that the benefits and pay is actually lower in these states where workers are not collectively bargaining. Now, one might argue that, you know, some of that has to do with the fact that the cost of living is lower and as a result, you don't have to pay people as much. But 
it seems to me that to bolster the senator's argument in these right to work states, workers aren't doing as well. And so what's in it for them? Well, I think the first point is obviously you'd have to control in any study for the effect of collective bargaining in the public sector. Um, you'd have to, con and this is what labor economists do, is they control for variables like changes in the cost of living. One can't expect that um, teachers on Long Island are going to be the paid the same as teachers in Louisiana, mm. right? Cost of living on Long Island and the cost of living in Louisiana are dramatically different. So you'd have to take, but even taking that into account, you're right. The truth is collective bargaining does increase salaries and benefits. It's the reason it makes government more expensive. It's good for workers in that, uh, in that sense. It's a, not a huge increase. Most of the studies find the increase somewhere at the low end between you know 2% more on pay and something more on benefits to at the higher end, 10% more in pay and, and consequently and maybe 20% more in benefits. But it's definitely the case that you're gonna see that. I just make one point to uh, Senator Savino's remarks, which is it's also true that <laughs> In, it sounds like this airtight logic, collectively, everyone's gonna do better if we're all in it together. That's true, but again, it's not true for every single worker. There's a lot of slippage there that the free rider position doesn't take account for, which is partly one of the problems in public employment, meaning work rules can make for extremely, extremely slow promotion schedules, right? For high performers, hard charging workers, that makes public employment less attractive. For people who are talented at the top end, think of a, a highly in demand science or math teacher, right? Maybe the collective bargaining agreement is winning them better benefits, but maybe if they were able to compete in surrounding school districts for uh, a better job offer, they would in fact do better. PSC CUNY agreed under Chancellor Goldstein, as an example of this, to allow people to be out of the salary schedule in order to retain uh, top faculty, because if everyone were in the compressed salary schedule, uh, people would just leave, who were top performers in their field, if they got offers at other colleges and universities that were well beyond what CUNY was paying, they would just leave. Mm -hmm. So now we have, it's all, it's on EJ's website, I'm in one of, the, I'm one of those people. So I've gone through this process of exercising that thing. I had a competitive job offer from another university, I went to CUNY because I like it there and I wanted to stay, but I wasn't gonna stay for that. And I was in effect now negotiating on my own behalf. Um, so that's- Wait, did it work? Your, what? Did it work? It worked, I'm still at CUNY. <laughs> but you can it, negotiate those things. So but I negotiated individually. The point there is that, that the idea that collectively every single, everyone is all gonna be better off is, is false. That is, there's a lot of slippage there and I wouldn't wanna just let that go in passing. Be before we move on, I do, and since you have the floor at the moment, I do wanna try and address an issue that I'm sure is gonna come up, uh, which is, and the senator addressed it in her opening remarks, which is this is an anti-union effort. This is an effort to kill unions. And to that end, you know, similarly, and I can only speak to my experience in my previous employer, there was an effort to do something similar to what you're suggesting to create like super positions, if you will, people who are hard charging, highly skilled, who could probably go elsewhere. And the union killed that repeatedly over and over and over. So, and the explanation was because that was a crack in the foundation, that that was seen as an effort by management to kill unions. So this, uh, this, this uh, situation, and it reminds me of you know, the idea of like the civil rights movement where you picked out a person to ride in the back of the bus or whatever it was that, that, that spurred a, a huge effort. Can you just address the fact that this is really part of more of a monolithic mm -hmm. anti-union surge? Well, it may be for, for some, but I think the issue here is first and foremost, this is a Supreme Court case. It's a case about fundamental constitutional First Amendment rights. But, now, but the question, would this have practical effects that might be detrimental to unions in the sense that, say here in New York, unions would immediately lose, assuming the case went in favor of Mr. Janus, the agency fee revenue um, that they had been collecting, assuming those workers all opted out, and potentially some people who are currently union members would decide, hey, now that I no longer have to pay, maybe union membership isn't worth it. 
I guess I would say, so that's one possible scenario that might then lead to less union political power. No, but the, address the why. In other words, is this really a First Amendment case? Or as the senator suggested, is Mr. Janus merely a tool of an anti-union effort? Well, I think, in fairness, I don't know Mr. Janus. I can't speak on his behalf. I can say that this is a number of many cases that the Supreme Court could have picked that had multiple plaintiffs from different states. Uh, there was a case that came out of Pennsylvania. Uh, what was already mentioned was the Friedrichs case out of California that had a half a dozen plaintiffs. So whatever forces are at work here, finding place, uh, plaintiffs or dissenting workers who feel that their First Amendment rights are being violated in Pennsylvania, in Illinois, in California, uh, in New York, doesn't seem to be very hard. So, Senator, do, do you want to respond to that? Because I have a question for you after you're done. Again, I think it's very clear. Mark Janice didn't wake up one day and decide that he wanted to bring a landmark case. Uh, there's, there are forces uh, that have been bringing cases like this uh, across the country, uh, state by state. You know, it, this is not an accident. Uh, the public sector is now the largest portion of the organized labor movement in this country. Uh, there are people who have been chipping away at labor's ability to influence it. There's no, there's, there's no secret that you know, the labor movement is the largest funder of the Democratic Party. In my opinion, the Democratic Party has an abusive relationship with the labor movement. Hopefully this is a wake-up call to them too. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, any, any effort to weaken the labor movement is you know, harmful to uh, the Democratic Party and some people see that as a benefit. Well, one might also argue, given recent history in New York, that labor actually has some sparks of positive movement. I mean, just look at what happened in Albany Med. How many years mm -hmm. had they tried right. there? 10, if 20, and they, and they unionized. I mean, clearly there are sectors, particularly healthcare, that are feeling, and I think the car wash workers and fast right. food workers, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, one might argue, regardless of what happens with Janice, there are people who want to join unions. Well, I started up by saying this is a historic time uh, where we're discussing a historic piece of, uh, of, of legislation and we're waiting for an historic ruling. Uh, but we are in many ways back where we were 50 years ago, 100 years ago, uh, in, in a lot of uh, areas. If you look at the economy now, we're almost at a full employment economy, right? That's what most people would say, where unemployment is at probably the lowest point in decades. But wages are stagnant and have been for a good 25 years. So even though more people are working, people are working longer, harder, and they're not making as much money. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's driving a lot of this new interest in, in, in how to have a greater voice at work. More people are working in the service economy, or more people are working in, in the non-unionized sector, uh, particularly in the private sector, than ever before. And so we're seeing workers kind of rising up. So we saw it with the fast food industry. We're seeing it in the, among the immigrant workforce, uh, in the like uh, the car wash, but they call them car wash arrows, etc. Right. Uh, people they want some sort of structure. I I've been speaking uh, at, to many groups, uh, particularly the AFL, that uh, we need to start to think about creating a new definition in labor law now. You know, labor law is relatively young, 85 years old. We have two hard definitions: you're an employee or you're an independent contractor, right? And everyone knows what they are. But we now have, I think some of you talked about your millennial children. The gig economy. Uh, the gig economy. What are they? They want the portability of being able to move from job to job. They, 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 but they also need some of the protections that the traditional labor law provides, the old industrial manufacturing model. Like, how do you have, you know, pensions and benefits and salary protections and at the same time, the ability to move um, from place to place. We're seeing it, especially in the tech world, uh, we're, and we're seeing the effect of the gig and the tech economy on the service sector. I mentioned briefly earlier about, uh, there was a, a press conference yesterday on the steps of City Hall. Uh, four cab drivers five. in the past, five, five cab drivers five. in the past five months have committed suicide. These were medallion owners. 10 years ago, a, a medallion in New York City was worth Almost a million dollars. But in a very clear, now it's worth nothing. I know, but in a very cynical thing that I will say that and not to denigrate the importance of the lives of the individuals and they felt financial stress, but why protect an outmoded industry? It's I mean, not about protecting it. Let me let me finish the point, Liz, because I, I I disagree with you on that. 
But we in government first established the policy that led to the monopoly that created the va this value, right? Mm -hmm. So we put these poor working people in this position where they became beholden to the medallion owners, right? So we created that first. And then we pulled the rug out from underneath them when we created a separate system because we became enamored with the tech world and Uber and, you know, a taxi is a taxi. You pick people up, you drive them around, you charge them money, it's a taxi. We but no, as no, we did. Consumers did. No, consumers, no, consumers did, but we that. developed the policy that said we're gonna treat this service differently than we do yellow cabs and green cabs. And so we created an environment because we were enamored with this new tech world that literally pulled the rug out from underneath an industry that we tightly regulated and controlled and devalued their property. How they don't have a class action lawsuit against the city of New York, I don't know. I'm not smart, some of you are lawyers, maybe you can figure it out. But then we flooded the city of New York with Uber and Lyft and all these cars and created an, a, an environment where there's almost no competition, so much competition, nobody can earn a living. Mm. So these workers, no one knows what they are. Are they independent contractors? Are they employees? They're really neither, they're somewhere in the middle. Labor law needs to figure out how to define this workforce. Okay, so go ahead. I, you should say it. Well, uh, on this point, I don't have much, I mean, it's a whole nother discussion of the gig economy, the status of private sector workers. Um, in a way, uh, you know, with all due respect to Senator Savino, it's a kind of, and I've been involved in these kind of discussions before, it's a classic tactic, which is I'm basically conceding uh, to kind of losing the debate on uh, agency fees. No, and excuse me, Dan, you're wrong. No, you're absolutely wrong. Conceded. And I'm just gonna <laughs> You are wrong, the, and, and I'm gonna tell you why you're hold wrong, on, and I'm gonna hold interrupt on, hold you. On, hold you are on. totally wrong, because again, if, if we lose the Janus decision, we lose agency fees, we lose the ability to collect union dues, we lose the ability to strengthen labor movements, who will speak for these workers, Senator. five of whom killed themselves? Senator. Who will be there if not a strong labor movement? That's why Janus is so important. I, I guess I would say that, again, it's, it's a little bit changing the topic. Public employee unions have nothing to do with the gig economy. A strong public sector labor movement doesn't have these kind of spillover effects. We've seen for 30 years, since the 1980s, 35% of public employees have been unionized. 70% here in New York have been unionized. But private sector unions have continued to decline. So it doesn't seem to me that there's a strong correlation between a strong public sector labor movement and reviving the private sector labor so, movement. The two things, again, as I tried to stress in the beginning, are a little different. So this idea of shifting, well, we need to move to talk about the private sector rather than the issues confronting the public sector situation seems to me to sort of just concede the case. Okay. okay. So I'll let, I'll let the members of the public employees union representatives here talk about their commitment to protecting the rights of not just their own members, but their efforts in protecting the rights of the non-unionized workforce out there and the private sector labor movement, because I've seen them do it. So if anybody wants to well, hold on. do that it's, when they get to the We're not going to turn this into a <laughs> manifesto. That. <laughs> That's not what we're going to do. No, but the, but idea, I, the, the idea that the, the public sector labor movement doesn't have a role to play is absurd. I, I do have a question, though, regarding wage ceiling, and, and one of you brought it up. You know, one of the things that strikes me is that the governor has complained on numerous occasions about his inability to attract really top talent, though he said that was one of his pledges in his first term, because he has not been able to convince the legislature to, well, the legislative salaries, as you know, are linked to the executive Mm -hmm. branch salaries and therefore he would have to give the legislature a raise which they have not received in since 1998 January and so also forward. subsequently he would be able to raise pay for executive uh, agency but that's a, that's not the collective bargaining folks the collective no. bargaining folks have uh, arguably a ceiling and then as Mr. Silva noted if you're really talented and the kind of people that you really you know are saying that you want you go into the private sector and make a lot more. Aren't you hampered in, in your capability of attracting the sort of top flight talent that you want to public sector life because of unions? I, I think it depends on the positions. I mean, I, maybe in the world of not academia. Not Mr. Cagliaros, right, other in, than him. Right, in academia, yes. I mean, certainly not in the Department of Transportation unless you're maybe architects or, or engineers. But uh, yeah, that's, there's, you know, there was a time um, 
when I first went into the public service, it was a commonly held belief that you didn't earn as much money as your counterparts in the private sector, but in exchange for that, you got due process, you got a pension, you got job security. Those, right. were, the, those were the things you gave up in exchange for um, the higher salary that you might earn in the private sector. Uh, I came into the social service field, and ironically, we earned more than our counterparts in the nonprofit sector, and that's probably still true today. Yeah. But though that was the trade-off um, in the government sector. And I think that's still true in some respects um, for a lot of people. But yeah, it, it's harder and harder. We're having a very difficult time, I think, in government because of, uh, of trying to uh, attract people into the IT world. You know, mm. 10 years, eight years ago, it was eight years ago, uh, I did legislation working with the Public Employees Federation to reduce the amount of outside contracting we, they, that the state relied upon on um, IT, te IT technology. Yeah. And, and it was like $7 billion worth of contracts. But we did the legislation, but at the time I said, I don't know how you're gonna attract people at the government level to come in IT professionals when they can make so much more in the private sector. And it's a problem that still exists today. I, I'd largely agree with, the, uh, with Senator Desfino's remarks on this point. Um, Public employment is different. It's not going to be able to pay those competitive salaries. Um, the other features of it that are going to be attractive to some workers, that is, um, it's very stable, it's very steady, um, there's a lot more job protections, um, it's much harder to be uh, fired in the public sector. That's going to appeal to a certain type of worker. Is that always the same kind of hard charging worker that, you exi that exists in uh, the top echelons of the private business world? That's just going to be a perennial um, problem um, in public employment because public employment is, is different than private employment. Do the unions uh, exacerbate that problem? Marginally, perhaps, but I don't think that's the biggest threat and it would be a problem, you know, it's a problem in Virginia which has no collective bargaining right. um, and very low union representation and it's a problem there as well, but you still have greater flexibility um, and in some ways lower cost. Um, because also if you think about top flight managers, it's not just that you're coming into a situation and it's a salary issue. If I come into a situation that's unionized and a lot of my management rights are highly constricted, my ability to have an impact and do things, right? I'm saying, well, I'm taking a lesser salary than I could make in the private sector. I want to make a big impact, improve public services, do something for the public good. I arrive at my office and I find my hands are tied and I can't do anything because of all of these pre-existing contracts, all of these past practices. Um, boy, that becomes a, a le much less attractive prospect. Okay, so we've been at this for about an hour. I'm gonna open it up for questions. <laughs> I'm going to be a hard ass about that, because I learned from the best. <laughs> Go ahead. Go open it up. Mr. DeSalvo, you've uh, mentioned uh, uh, a lot of things. You've so, sort of painted a broad brush. My question to you is, um, I, my name is Rich Mulvaney, by the way, I'm the mm -hmm. general counsel for uh, many different law enforcement unions, most specifically the National Troopers Coalition, and I buried a state trooper in Florida, and his life was worth $34,000. That's what his life was worth. Uh, they did not have collective bargaining. It's a right to work state because of the state position that this gentleman was in. I see a gravitation where the attrition rate just given a fact basis here, Ms. Benjamin, I apologize, where the gravitation, the attrition rate of a state, Florida State Trooper is at the average employment is 3.2 years. They leave employment after six months in the academy and gravitate towards unionized positions in local municipalities throughout the state of Florida. This happens in Georgia, Texas, every other right to work state in which I represent specific labor unions or organizations and right to work organizations or associations. In Virginia, like you had mentioned, they have a grid system where no employee has been given a raise in this uh, law enforcement trooper has been given a raise in some 11 years, yet they could not hire rookies to come in because of such a low wage rate. They actually made the grid as a starting trooper 13% more than a, than a sergeant with 26 years. So I have to say this, um, and I'm going to ask you, what is the difference? Let's get back to the debate here. What is the difference between the Abood case, which made a broad sweeping labor policy issue back in the 70s, 
and some 41 years later, in which Janice seeks its, its ugly head again, what is the difference between the two cases that you can discern why the Supremes would take this case again? Well, I think the, the, the world has changed. The Abood case in 1977 um, was a, raised many of the same questions that are at issue today. Um, about freedom of, freedom of speech, freedom of association. The court came out with a different outcome, saying that states and localities could charge agency fees, but it recognized that it was creating, an, in the court's language, an impingement on right, free speech rights. And the Abood case then led to 40 years of jurisprudence contesting all of these impingements, whether that's Lernert or Hudson or in more recent times, Harris, Knox. So I think we're, this case has come up because there's been much litigation over the last 40 years. There's also been much experience with unionizing public employment and the amount of political activity that this created. Um, it's, a, it's of a size and scope that just wasn't obvious to the justices in 1977. Um, the amounts of money spent, the kinds of political activities, so lots of new experience raises new issues. It's also a whole new court. And it's a whole new court. Yeah. Senator, do you have anything to add? I mean, I think we're ignoring um, the, the change uh, in, I, I don't think we can ignore it. So obviously the, the Citizens United case uh, and since then the ability of people to spend unlimited amounts of money uh, influencing public policy across the country. Uh, we've seen its effect, um, the number of right to work states, I think Richie referenced, uh, the changes in public policy, uh, the loss of collective bargaining and, and you know, the public sector collective bargaining in a place like Wisconsin. None of these things were done by accident. Uh, so what we're seeing now since 1977 is a far more organized, well-financed effort by people who have seen the rise of the public sector, uh, the the, the collapse of the private sector labor movement, uh, and they see that the public sector is far more organized and far more influential, and they are tr they are doing their level best to see to it that they, you know, kneecap it, and that's really what's behind this. It's not. It, it, Dan may may have made some points, in, but there also is some philosophical, I guess, changes in thought. But behind this is it's purely about money. To, to pick up that thread, I want to reference something that Senator Cimino just said about you know, where this is coming from and where the agenda is coming from. Liz mentioned the word monolithic. Uh, I think it, it's the concept of that there is a, a right-wing um, industry out there that's trying to go after public sector unions. So my question to Mr. DeSalvo is, are you aware that the Manhattan Institute, which you're affiliated with, is an associate member of the State Policy Network, which is a right-wing uh, collection of organizations? They had some internal documents released last year in which they said that their agenda was to defund and defang public sector unions. I, I guess I think we can have an honest debate, but it would be helpful if the facts came forward. I, I would prefer if someone on a panel says, look, I just think that we ought to drive down the cost of wages and benefits for public sector workers so we can give more tax breaks to rich people, and then we could have an honest conversation. In Wisconsin, what happened after the change in the collective bargaining so law was that public sector workers saw their health insurance premiums rise from hundreds of dollars a year to thousands of so dollars wait, a year. So wait, your question is whether Mr. DeSalvo is aware of the association, is that correct? Well, my, my question is, or if he, is he aware that the organization that he's affiliated with is part of a network whose yes. stated goal is to defund and defang public sector unions? I'm, I'm aware of it. Okay, great. Thanks. John O'Malley, uh, well, CWA. Hold on. I don't, just, just to be clear though, uh, if you if you'll be if you'll be so kind, the, I don't think anybody's surprised or anybody was under any illusions about where Mr. DeSalvo stands vis-a-vis Ms. Savino, vis-a-vis -vis this organization, et cetera. I mean, what we're trying to do here is have a discussion. There's clearly a philosophical difference. It's not a forum where anybody was trying to pull the wool over anybody else's eyes. I think that at the outset we were pretty clear on where everybody stood. I understand your point, certainly. I guess the point is, let's not pretend that Mark Janice is some guy out there on his own who's not funded right. by the National Right to Work Foundation. With Which the senator and, did make that point. And they knew that the court now is different than the, than the Abood court that voted nine. Not right, and I think that what we're also discussing is the fact that I think that nobody also in this room is under any illusion that it's, if we were all betting, 
if this was a sports situation, now it's sort of legal, though we have no regulations promulgated yet, that you know, you would be stupid to bet against the likelihood that this court is probably gonna move in the direction that it will move in, in favor of Mr. Janus, right? Now the question is, what happens? What will the outcome be? Is that a bad thing? Is that a good thing? That's the conversation that I think we're having here, or we're trying to have here, not, well, what was the, uh, not to say that the philosophical argument is n and the ideological argument is not part and parcel of that conversation, it is. But there are other aspects of this conversation that I think are also equally important because the train is coming and you know, you're, you, you're either gonna get off the track and figure out a way or you're gonna get smashed. Um, can I just Go one ahead. word on this point? You know, it, again, th this comes up a lot in these sort of forums, but th it's basically, and it's a point that's certainly legitimate and can be made, and has been made by Senator Savino, and you've made it. Um, but just attacking the the funders or the, the groups involved in this and their uh, and, uh, and attributing to them bad motives um, is again a sort of just distracting, I think, from the core substantive issues that are being debated, both the legal issues in front of the Supreme Court, the potential policy consequences. Um, you know, I'm, I'm here out of my own, for my own views, and, and I'm offering to them to you as candidly, I think, as I can. Um, but it's just a distracting technique to engage in ad hominem attacks. Sir? John O'Malley from CWA Local 1180. Um, I think from this panel and the earlier panel and the reports and everything that I know, uh, people are trying to make this distinction that uh, where there's a union and where the union is stronger, uh, people get paid more, their health benefits are better, uh, there's less poverty, there's less people dying in childbirth. So where there's a union, things are better, not just for the union members, but for places where there is no union. And, and legislatively things are better. And everything is better where there's unions. So at the same time though, it seems like everybody's saying, well one of the solutions to this problem is that we should weaken unions. And so I'm trying to figure out um, how that's the best solution and if there is some other more effective way that we can deal with this problem, which seems to be the government costs too much. Hmm. So just to be clear, the question is what exactly, got the high cost of government and is it actually the fault of unions or is there some other way that we could be addressing that issue? Okay. Well, I think it's, <laughs> I guess my remarks are, uh, first I would dissent uh, somewhat from uh, your claim that everything is better where there are uh, strong public employee unions. I, I guess, I think that public employee unions do win better things for their members. But I would strongly contest, as I said in my opening remarks, the idea that they have threat effects, meaning they raise surrounding salaries um, in, uh, you know, in other, for other workers. Um, public employee unions don't even have politically egalitarian effects of mobilizing voters that, the same way that private sector unions do. Um, they mobilize voters, but because public sector unions represent uh, workers who tend to have higher levels of education and income already would be more likely to go to the polls than say um, a factory worker, and the union there is doing a real political mobilization that wouldn't occur otherwise. So I don't think that everything is, is just is great and what you see is it drives up the cost of government which in turn has a huge effect on the cost of living um, which means that in some of the states like New York and California where you have the strongest public sector unions you also have some of the highest inequality in the country and the highest cost of living uh, problems that are squeezing out the middle class. Now, we can maintain a, a well-compensated um, public sector middle class, but at the cost of, uh, in a sense, the middle class of the private sector. I'm not, I'm not even sure where to start. So, I mean, you mentioned this more than once, Dan, that, that public sector unions don't drive voters outside, I think their own members is the way you put it, and I'm not sure where you get that information from. I'm not sure whether it's anecdotal or whether it's just your own experience, but having been a political director for, I think it's the third largest, no, it's actually the second largest union now in District Council 37 at the time when I was there, it was the third largest union, 18,000 members. Um, I ran a few campaigns over the years before I decided to run for office myself. And part of what we, 
DC 37 certainly did, and many of the other public sector unions do. You work in the coordinated campaigns with others, uh, driving turnout, not just among your own members, you're working with the Central Labor Council, working with the AFL-CIO, working with the building trades. In, you know, in a previous life, I was in the executive board of the Working Families Party, um, something I may have to strike from my bio one day. Um, Anyway, don't, don't write let's, that. Let's not, let's not. That's a whole but different situation. point is, we didn't just speak to our own members. We identified candidates, we supported them, but we worked in coordination with other labor and community organizations to drive turnout for either candidates or for ballot initiatives that we supported because they benefited not just our own members, but the broader, um, you know, either labor movement or even the communities or the city or state in general. So it's, it's not true to say that they don't drive turnout. In fact, the public sector often had the ability to do it where some of the smaller unions didn't have the wherewithal or the capacity to do it. So we did do that. Um, do unions, do we improve conditions for our own members? Yes. That, that's, that's the whole purpose behind it. Uh, that, other than that, why would anybody pay dues to a union? What would be the purpose of belonging to one if they weren't going to improve the terms and conditions for, for their own members? And, 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 and while, yes, before you did say not everybody benefits, that's true. The purpose of a union um, is that not that everyone gets equal outcome, but that everyone gets equal opportunity, or as my grandfather used to say, is you're benefiting the many at the expense of the few. That's mm -hmm. the idea behind it. Uh, but that if you're all working together, you'd stand a much better shot at fairness and due process than if you try and strike out on your own individually. Hi, Greg Burke with the Council of School Superintendents. Um, I think the, the impacts of Janice is exaggerated on both sides, probably to some extent. But there's a follow-up case, Yon v. California, which would eliminate opt-out and make an opt-in to join the union. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on whether that would have a more dramatic impact on the actual union and how many people join, I, I would speculate much more significant because the idea of getting a $45,000 teacher to have to sign a paper, check off a box to actually commit five, six hundred, seven hundred dollars to the union instead of just being in automatically could change the dynamic. And just any thoughts on that case? I, I'm not familiar with, I'm not familiar with, are you familiar with this case? Yeah. So, so the opt-in would be to join or to pay, do, so explain it. So you, the default now is that you are an you're in as an agency fee payer right. um, until you opt out. Right. This would change the default to you're out until you opt in to being mm -hmm. a part as say a, a new employee. That is, you would pay zero out of the gates versus where uh, is it right now? It's in, it's in California. Yeah. So, yeah. Works right so now. this is one of the differences. Uh, this is a really good question. Um, I just want to say two quick things. This is an important one. This is one of the differences between this case, Janice, mm -hmm. before the Supreme Court now, and the Friedrichs case. The Friedrichs case was contesting both the opt-in, opt-out issue and agency fees, whereas the Janus case only does the agency fees. Hence, there's a series of other cases around the country that will try to contest the opt-in, opt-out, especially after everyone read the Knox decision. I guess I don't want to overstate, and I think this is a point that's gotten neglected, the, say, negative impact on the unions. I think public employee unions, you know, you read lots of op-eds in the nation and so on, that this, this uh, Janus decision will devastate public employee unions or destroy them. And you can read things on the, the right in the conservative uh, press that says, and cheers that, says, yes, it's, it is going to devastate it. I really think that it's going to be, it's much, much more uncertain what its effects are going mm -hmm. to be. They're probably likely to be much more modest than either side thinks. Lots can be done, as we already see now, legislatively to change right. things here in New York and New Jersey to respond to the decision. It's also important to recognize that public employee unions, where they're strong, New York, California, elsewhere, they're starting from a position of strength. They are not all of a sudden overnight going to come to resemble um, Wisconsin. And Wisconsin's a terrible comparison because not only did they eliminate agencies, but Act 10 goes way further than just eliminating agency fees. So when people make comparisons, oh, this amount of union decline occurred in Wisconsin, that's what's going to happen after Janus. That is a total misreading of the situation. So uh, because this, it, you're just doing the agency fee portion were the case to be decided in favor of Mr. Janus. And finally, the un public employee unions have been on a vast organizing campaign for three years or more because they could see this coming from the Friedrichs case. 
So I think the declines will, will be not as immediate, not as steep, and again, you're starting from, in a sense, a position of strength. Um, I, 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 agree with, I agree with Dan on that point. Um, as I said earlier, I think the, the whole focus on the Janus case has made a lot of unions uh, wake up and realize that they had to do a better job of interacting with their members, direct discussion, direct um, contact with them. Uh, I joined uh, the Social Service Employees Union the first week on the job because they came to an employee orientation, a new member orientation, and they gave a presentation and they handed out union cards and they explained to me why it was in my interest to join the union. A lot of unions don't do that, or they didn't. Uh, and a lot, of, with, a lot of the locals within DC 37 didn't practice that. And quite honestly, they didn't do it because they got into the habit of, um, if you didn't enroll people in the union, they couldn't vote against you when you ran for president. It was a very cynical way of running a union. Um, and unfortunately, you know, they are playing catch up now. Mm. But I belong to a strong union. Um, and so this should be a wake up call for, uh, for union leadership you know, to realize that you have, a re you have a responsibility to your members, not just at the bargaining table, but you know, in every way and in every aspect to protect them. And the best way to do that is to make sure that you're members. So I think we have time for like two, given the time that we've been allotting here, about two questions. So you can duke it out. Uh, <laughs> or just agree within your Selves. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Anthony Powell. I run a uh, an independent nonprofit, uh, nonpartisan organization that focuses on the importance and benefits of civic engagement amongst the younger generation of Brookhaven residents on Long Island. Um, part of my question is: is a lot of the anger towards unions generally misplaced? In that you could you could probably say that they effectively advocated on behalf of their membership and. The responsibility of the, the cost being so high could be laid at the feet of the elected officials who didn't necessarily do their job in terms of sitting on the other side of the table mm -hmm. and representing the uh, constituent base that they were uh, elected to. And, and the second part of that is if the Janus decision moves forward in favor of the plaintiff, understanding that, uh, and I think there was some agreement there, that the unions themselves are going to have to market themselves to the public sector employees to get buy-in. Um, would something like that take place on 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 town time, county time, would, mm. would whatever yeah. generally a, a lot of that stuff That's happens? Allowed. So That's allowed. Is, That's allowed. Right. So yeah. so I'm saying is is that uh, a negative consequence to uh, a decision like um, that, knowing okay. that there's probably going to be a lot more time spent on marketing and uh, right. advocacy? Huh. So on the on the let's say I, so I've been on both sides of the issue as a, having been a union member, an executive board member, an officer, and now an elected official. Um, the, the question about are, I guess, members of the public, ang why are they angry at unions or who do they hold responsible? My general experience is they're really not angry at unions. Um, you may have taxpayers who are angry at the cost of government, um, but in many respects, they go to the voting booth and they vote for the same government because they like it, particularly in, in the suburbs. Uh, Mike is sitting in front of me. People complain about the cost of government in the suburbs, but they drive the cost of government because they like their police officers, they like their town council, they like, like we tried to pass government consolidation laws mm -hmm. over and over. Nobody wants to consolidate because they like their town and village and local governments. They just don't like yours or yours or yours or yours, right? That's just the way, that's the way people are. That's what drove the creation of the suburbs. We have 700 school districts because people want their own school district. You know, we've talked over the years, I think, Bill, you and I have talked about the idea of regional collective bargaining. Um, it makes sense on so many levels. Nobody wants to do it. So there are ways to drive down the costs of government that could probably protect people's rights, and, but nobody wants to do it because everybody wants what they have. So I'm not sure who they're really angry at. Um, with respect to the contracts, I heard the first panel talk about some of the things that they've been saddled with. Those, nobody's saddled with them. They've been negotiated over the years. Remember, there are times when there's no money at the bargaining table. And so that's when you negotiate work rule changes that maybe years later become expensive or don't seem to make sense to the newest person who's you know, the new mayor or the town, or the village you know, leader, whoever now has to negotiate. But at the time, it made sense. All of those things are negotiated. I have not seen a union leader yet bring a gun to a bargaining table, right? Everything you get, you get in the negotiation. And so everything you negotiate, you can negotiate over again in the future if you can find some reason for them to take it out of the contract. 
Yeah, again, I, I agree. Uh, I have a slightly different interpretation on the, of the Senator Savino on the on the politicians. I think your your instincts are right. Politicians are certainly liable. They're deeply implicated in um, the scheme of um, public employee unions, largely funding their campaigns and engaging in extensive lobbying with people they're going to sit across the table from. National AFSCME, uh puts on their website, "We elect our bosses," right? That's true. and so partly <laughs> the issue is one of you know, you have an, a, an intense interest group that has powerful incentives to engage in political activity, and then you have dispersed voters, right, who are often not as well informed, aren't paying attention to all of the detailed issues. Um, so partly you have a mobilized group that can exercise influence, and then you have the sort of collective mass of voters who are sometimes organized by other groups that contest that, but not always. And paying attention to public sector labor relations and public sector issues, pensions. I mean, before the Great Recession, I would submit most people who were not involved in this world uh, could hardly, dis and didn't have one, probably because they weren't a public employee, could hardly describe how a defined benefit pension system worked. Now, since the recession, this has become a contested political issue. It's received a lot more press attention. There's new groups that want to change pension systems in state and local government. So citizens are now informed as a discussion. You know, prior to 2008, how many people were talking about public sector unions? You know, a bunch of academics and, and practitioners like yourselves. Um, so there's a bit of a, a mobilization question for who are politicians going to respond to? the voters in, in the mass or an intense uh, interest group that's really paying close attention to the detailed issues. We have one more question. Wait, did you already ask a question? I you did. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just in the interest of equality. Sorry to cut you off. Dan Levler. Um, I'm wondering, in light of the, the Janus decision and, and the aspect of it that basically takes away uh, the need for someone to pay to be part of an association uh, and comparing that to something like the Bar Association, which requires membership and requires payment. Uh, what do you see as the distinction between the two? Do you have to get into the Bar Association? Either, either or preferably both. Huh. Oh, you mean as an attorney? I don't know. I mean, hmm. So you have to belong to the Bar Association. I didn't know that either. You have to, as an attorney, belong to the Bar Association? If you're practicing in the state. No. Yeah. Right, you do. Do you have to? You do have to. Now, it's a good question, and um, I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. I don't play one I on didn't television. Know <laughs> Take it away, Dan. It, it is um, <laughs> basically this. It's an analogy that came up. Uh, if you and if you listen to the oral argument um, in the Janus case, which is available online, uh, the first ten minutes are taken up with discussing exactly this analogy. Right? <laughs> what are agency fees analogous to mm -hmm. uh, bar association fees and you're required to pay into the bar or are they in some ways different? And you can imagine the justices come out with um, the liberal justices seeing them as somewhat analogous and, and therefore uh, the beginnings of a set of reasoning for why agency fees should be with upheld as constitutional because you're already doing this. Uh, the other example that's often used is uh, student activity fees in universities, uh, in public universities. It's been challenged. Which has also been challenged. So now the, the conservative sides are more skeptical that bar association fees are just basically not a good an analogy to agency fees um, because they're ultimately doing different things. Um, so it's, it's not a good analogy is hmm. the quick short Well, but answer. wait, but uh, it, uh, the Bar but Association doesn't collectively bargain on behalf no. of attorneys, no, correct? No, but it's, no. I, 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 can, I can clear that part up. It's the Office of Court Administration. You have to pay an annual fee to maintain your license to practice law. It is not the Bar Association. That is what makes you a member of the bar. There are m tons of bar associations across the state. They're all voluntary. They don't do any collective bargaining. Sometimes they have group insurance products. That's about it. Right. And, and so if you don't pay your fee, you don't pay your license, if you don't pay the fee to OCA, right. and you don't maintain your license, you can't like, practice law. You can't like practice. That's a professional that's requirement. A, it's profes it is a professional requirement, and the function is to pay for disciplinary, so to get rid of the bad lawyers, right? So hmm. they can do Does the investigation. Does it fund the commission on judicial conduct? 
Uh, must... No, that's judges. Oh, uh, sorry. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's, sorry. A, there's a grievance process I'm for, mixing for my yeah. Interesting. legal aspects. All right. Uh, unfortunately, we we have a hard out in like about 10 minutes, so I'm going to cut it off. I thank you very much. Did you want it? Do you feel compelled? All right, go for okay. it. Okay, <laughs> go ahead, John. <laughs> All right, so for the almost 30 years that I've been involved with public sector unions, we've always been told that we can't use the tool of the strike because, one of the reasons anyway, is because we can elect our bosses. Mm -hmm. And so why is it a surprise or why is there a negative connotation to the fact that public sector unions use that tool of, of political action as opposed to strikes? It seems like a lot of what Mr. DeSalvo is saying is that's an outsized influence of public sector unions when that's the tool that we've been given to use. Yeah, I, I, again, as I said, in agreement with uh, Senator Savino, public sector unions banding together, exercising their First Amendment rights to form associations, pressure government, lobby, do all of that stuff, is perfectly legitimate. The issue in the Janus case is, is it legitimate to then also coerce people who don't want to be part of that to pay into the same organization? because the effect of agency fees is to increase the number of members and money. That's why membership is so much higher in New York than it is in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. That's the whole coercive device. So I'm perfectly happy with letting public sector unions politic as, uh, to their heart's content, um, just not on the backs of coercing um, a not insignificant percentage of public employees, meaning thousands uh, of public employees across the country. But I, I think that's where we, we all probably differ, Dan. Um, Dan. I mean, I don't know what this stuff is. It's like, it's, it's like, it's like slime. What is it? It's a disgusting slime. I don't know what it is. <laughs> but like watching you struggle. What you call coercion, we simply look at as a fee for the service that they're getting. The ability to be represented at the bargaining table, the ability to be represented in a disciplinary or a grievance and violation of a contract that they don't want to pay for. They want the benefit and the services. They want to be able to go to the dentist. They want to be able to go to the doctor. They want to be able to go to the pharmacy. They want to be able to get all the benefits of membership, but they don't want to pay for it. See, that's what's wrong with this argument. They're not coerced into it. They want to be freeloaders, and they don't want to pay for it. That's really what it's about. Mark Janice is not offended by anything. He's not offended. Have spoken to Mark Janice? I know it, okay? Believe me. I've met Mark Janice. Like I've, met, I've met a Mark Janice a million times. It's all about the idea that I could put a few dollars more in my pocket every year. Okay. And by the way, you're forced by law right. to provide me all of those benefits. So we're getting to the ideological stalemate yes, here. So that's a really good place is. to cut it off. <laughs> And unless you feel compelled to restate your position. Okay, thank you very much, okay. everyone, you, for everyone. participating in the Empire Center for hosting.